So, Father, I do thank you so much for our church. I thank you for my pastor and father-in-law who's been so faithful. Just keeps on clicking. A lot of good things come out of that that you're able to use. I thank you for all that are steady here, are stable, that come to learn and grow. Not only just hear, but do. I pray that we'd be doers, Father, not just hearers. Easy to be a hearer. I do ask you to heal Zoe. Use this in her life as a reminder of how much you love her and how you have a plan for her. So whatever is going to be lasting out of this, make it something in her heart that is positive towards you. Pray for her mom and dad who's certainly worried for the ministry that she has with, with Willie and all of the young people. Uh, I ask you to bless Tad and Wendy Boyle and their life this last period it looks like. Joel says Tad's excited to go. He's packing his bags. He's ready to go. So I understand that, Father. The closer you get to this end of it, the more you look past death into the next life. And it's where we ought to be looking anyway, looking to Jesus, which is our lesson today. And I do pray for Gary that, you're this, that, that, that you would have ministry for him, that somehow, since he can't travel, he'd find a way to do ministry, Father, and, and go out of this life going so fast so fast that he leaves skid marks on the throne room of God when he gets there. So we love you, Lord. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, I want you to open your Bibles. Second Corinthians chapter three. I appreciate John made this and used Hebrews 12 too. So that's cool. I titled this Looking to Jesus. The point of it, should we not get there, which is always possible, is looking to Jesus, comparing yourself to Christ instead of others, instead of people. I consistently find myself judging by comparing other people to me. Why aren't you living up to my standards? Why aren't you doing it as well as I want you to or I would have you? Why, why is our government, et cetera, et cetera. I look to people, I look at people, I compare myself with people as if somehow I'm better or I'm worse. And the truth is, we're all equally lost, then we're all equally saved, we're all equally in Christ with the 50 things that we mentioned earlier, and we're all equally ambassadors and priests, and we're all equal. And we look to the Lord to compare ourselves, because it's Him we're growing to become like. Not just, I mean, not, others can be a great example to your life because they're on that same path and they're further down the road. So if you got 2 Corinthians 3, the first 16 verses are basically uh, setting up uh, this, the last two, not just setting up, but listen, part of Paul's mission was to explain the transition from life under the Mosaic law to the church age way of life. Much of his writing is devoted to that. He teaches the Christian life while explaining this transition. That's what he's doing in chapter 3 here. Because he brought news of the end of the law, the Jewish believers and the Jews and wherever he was wanted to, who wanted to hold on to the law often maligned him and challenged him as a legitimate apostle I wanted to read Acts 18, where he gets to Corinth, and, he's, and, and, and Luke tells us, he gets to Corinth, and every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, 
trying to persuade the Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, he devoted himself exclusively to preaching and teaching to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed him and became abusive, he shook, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of any responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So this is what he's dealing with in this book when he talks. He had a lot of critics in Corinth. Now in verse 1 through 6, let's just read it. He said, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need some people, like some people, letters of recommendation uh, to you, from you? In other words, do we have to establish our credibility? You yourselves are our letter of recommendation written on your hearts, or our hearts known and read by everyone. In other words, Paul's saying the fact that you exist as believers is proof of our ministry and credibility with you. We brought the gospel to you. So, you show that you're a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, and here's where he's talking about the law, not written with ink on scrolls, but with the spirit of the living God, new, new covenant, new covenant writing on the heart. Not on tablets of stone, but tablets of human hearts. So you see the comparison of the old, old covenant, tablets of stone, and the new covenant tablets, I mean, written on the heart through the Holy Spirit. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we're competent in ourselves to, to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Here's this humility. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. The letter kills. Now what that means is the old, the Mosaic law, its purpose was to show that you were a sinner and show the, you that you were spiritually dead and needed Christ. That was his purpose. He said the letter kills. He says in Romans that the law itself instigated re rebellion against the law. The fact that you, thou shalt not, you say, oh, I certainly will. Tell me I can't do something. Now, I know I've made an idiot out of myself at times, but I used to go in stores and they would say, we have to have your zip code before, and I would go, you don't have to have anything from me. See what I'm saying? I ha you have to. Oh. And that's what Paul says about the law. You, shall, you're, you can't do that? Oh, yes, I can. So, and it shows you that you're spiritual. It shows you that you're a rebel. Now, verse 7, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, in other words, Moses would go in and talk to God. When he got through talking to God, he came out, his face was bright as the sun. It would just, the glory of God would shine in his face. But he's going to say, it faded. After days, it faded away. That glory faded. You know why it faded? Because that Mosaic law was going to fade and die out. So, Moses would put on a mask. He veiled his face so that the, so that the Jews could not see it, this glory fading away and therefore, you know, discourage them or they would lose confidence. So, the ministry that brought death was engraved in letters of stone, came with the glory, the shining of his face, so that Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory. Fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness, like the new church, church age doctrine? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. In other words, the old Mosaic law no longer has any glory at all. 
It's come, it's served its purpose, it's been fulfilled, and it's gone. It's done. It's done. It was done when the temple, the veil, was torn from top to bottom. And the Holy of Holies was opened, and now we have access to the Holy of Holies through Christ. The shadows of the law have been fulfilled with the reality of Christ. It's done. So, some say, and I, David and I have been discussing this, and, and, and I said all that about our ministry, so you can go to alrosenbloom.com. A lot of videos there, a lot of information there if you want, a lot of stuff I've taught. Uh, if you want to give, you can, you can contribute to it there. But we've been discussing how this trip Paul took to Jerusalem with the money, was that, was he in the will of God? Or was he out of the will of God? So it's interesting to see, uh, I forget what got me into that, why I told you about that, but uh, if the ministry that condemns men is glorious, how much more the ministry that brings righteousness, oh, what, here. When he went back to Jerusalem, the law's over with. They're still practicing it. James is telling them how zealous all the new believers are for the law. And he convinces Paul to go to the temple and perform a purification rite at the temple under the law. Now here's the guy that's been teaching that the law is finished. It's done its job. It's glorious. It was God's will, but it's done its job. Therefore, it no longer applies. He puts himself back under it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think so. But what, what glory has, it has no glory now in comparison with the new covenant. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory that which is this going to last? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we're bold. We're not like Moses who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from looking at it while the radiance was fading away. Now notice what they were looking at. Their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Okay, so the old covenant is finished. They had to pre they had to go through this pretending thing. Mo they went through this pretense. Moses puts a veil on his face so that they can't see the reality. Let me ask you a question: Do you have a veil over your heart about the realities in your life? Do you have to pretend that something? is this way or that way in order not to look at the reality of your own heart or of your relationships? Do you have to pretend it's called, it's named after a river in Egypt? You know what the river in Egypt, Egypt is? Denial. Denial, yeah, denial. So listen, take the veil off and look at reality. Look at the truth. God operates through truth, not pretense, not, not pretending, not looking away. He deals with truth. So let's look at verse 17 and 18, and we'll dig in a little bit. So 17, he says, now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. Now, that seems pretty straightforward to me, but you would not believe how much print is dedicated to whether that the Lord is the Holy Spirit, Jesus is the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit is Jesus, or the Holy Spirit is the Lord. Just like Jesus is the Lord, Holy Spirit's the Lord. He's inside of you. He's indwelling you. He's the, he's the power, the vision, the ability to look at Jesus. He enables you to look at Jesus. So, and then he says, and we who with unveiled faces 
all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, I should have read that before I read it, but look on your paper. At the bottom of your paper is a better way of saying this. He says, but we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror. That's what that word means, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, go back to verse 17. Let's look at verse 17, and you can look at your page. He says, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, what he's discussing here is spiritual freedom. What, what he earlier in Galatians calls spiritual liberty or spiritual freedom. Uh, you're free from spiritual blindness. You're free from darkness. Look back at your page for just a minute and go on over to chapter 4 because, see, this thought continues on to chapter 4 to verse 6. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we don't lose heart, rather we have renounced secret and shameful ways. This is the pretending stuff. We do not use deception. We do not distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every conscience in the sight of God. And he says, even if our gospel is veiled. See, he's back to this veiled idea. It is veiled to those who are perishing because the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. So they cannot see the light of the gospel and the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, here's the point. We've got to take off the veil and look at Christ. Because you're going to look at Christ in the mirror. Guess who else you're going to look at in the mirror? <laughs> this is James. James says that, you know, if you're a hearer of the word and not a doer, then you go look at your face in the mirror and then you turn away and forget what you saw. You look at your face in the mirror and you see your inconsistencies and your hypocrisies and the fact that you desire the wrong things and you've attached yourself to the wrong things to get the, your needs met. And you see that, but you turn away and you go right about living the way you were. He said, a doer looks into the perfect law of liberty. Same word here, liberty. The spirit gives you spiritual freedom. And this person becomes a doer. So we want to look into the mirror and become doers. Doers. So verse 17 is, is mirrored in Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm. And do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery, in other words, to the law. For you were called to freedom, verse 1, chapter 5, verse 13, you were called to freedom. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So we've been set free where the spirit frees us from the sin nature. The truth of the word of God frees us from the old ways of thinking. We've been set free. And now what we're supposed to do with this freedom is grow, develop the mind of Christ, the thinking of Christ, the living of Christ, to become like Christ to such a degree that we begin to have the same glory as Christ, that we reflect the Lord's glory so that others can see, not with a mask on, with unmasked face, showing God's glory. But you have to get set free from this to, in order to fully devote yourself to the Lord. Because you keep going back, keep going back, keep going back. Just like me. So he says, prior to salvation, we were enslaved to the sin nature, the old belief system, the habits and patterns, seeking happiness from people and circumstances. Focused on the things of this life. What Paul calls the flesh. 
I've come to believe that, that the, we, we focus on sin. Listen, we focus on sin as if the goal of the Christian life is to not sin. I'm a mature believer if I don't sin. By not sinning, or listen, or by appearing not to sin, because I'm ascetic and moral, and I don't commit any obvious lascivious or clear sins, I don't sin a lot, I just live this moral life, then I'm being spiritual. Well, you may be filled with the Spirit, but are you growing? Are you pursuing a life of love? Are you, are you pursuing the laying aside of your, your selfishness and taking on the generosity and love of the Lord? See, not sinning is like not playing the game. If you pursue maturity in the Lord full out all the way, you're going to make all kinds of mistakes. What you're going to discover is that you've been making a lot of mistakes anyway. But you got to pursue the Lord. You got to pursue a love relationship with the Lord. The love with Him, this love relationship that begins to spill over out into other people. <laughs> Listen, what if your whole Christian life was simply devoted not to sin? So that's what I think Paul means in, in Romans 6 14 when he says, Sin shall not be your master because you're not under law, but under grace. When you live by law, it doesn't have to be the Mosaic law. It can be your own set of rules. Then your goal is to not break the rules. Stay in your lane and don't break the rules. Now, I'm not advocating breaking the rules. If you hung out with me long enough, you'd see <laughs> that... I'm not much of a rule keeper, but anyway, the goal is not to just not break the rules. That's a focus on law and a focus on failure. Am I failing or succeeding? Am I failing or succeeding? Am I loving? Am I growing in love? Am I growing in my sensitivity to others and the needs that they have? Am I focused on what other people need? What the Lord has given me that I can share with them. Not am I not sinning. Now look, again, I'm not advocating sinning. I'm advocating growing in love is your priority. And of course, resist sin. Of course, resist. See, again, Romans 6, Paul says, so we we're saved by grace. So that means we should just go out and sin like crazy. And that's what people accused him of. Paul, you said there's no more law. So you're saying people should just do whatever they want. He's like, guys, guys, come on. That's ridiculous. I'm not saying that at all. So neither am I, guys. I'm just saying the goal is to grow in love, not just to not sin or not to break your rules. When you conduct your relationships based on rules, this is so important. When you... When you evaluate the people in your life based on whether they're keeping or breaking your rules then you are a judge and you live by law and relationships don't work by law they do if you're the judge but I don't think anybody in here is a judge not supposed to be we put ourselves there I do that And I, and I don't want to do that. I want to forgive. I want to love. I want to not, I don't want to not need to forgive so that I, because I didn't go there. You failed. You broke somebody's rules or God's rules or look, you're forgiven. Where did our sins go? They're listen, they're forgiven. They're forgiven. We're not under rule system. We're not under a system of rules. Break the rules. Oh, I broke the rule. No. Now, should we be sensitive to when we sin? Of course. Confess that. Acknowledge that. The biggest part of the flesh is your human agenda. 
It's, it's you trying to find happiness and success and meaning and purpose apart from God in your human life. Your financial security, the way people think about how you look or how your home looks or how your children behave or your appearance to other people, that's your human agenda. That's the biggest part of this thing so, is you're trying to find your life in this life apart from God. I believe that's the biggest part of it, not whether you're sinning or not. Sin is something you're going to do. It's just part of your nature, your old nature. Now, you don't have to. Did you know that you could get filled with the Spirit right now and never sin again? Did you know that? You have that power in the Spirit to never sin again. Now, who's up for that? Any volunteers? Look, go at the Lord. Go after Him. Pursue Him. Come, try to know Him. Try to learn about Him. Try to understand what He's telling you, what He's teaching you, what He, what he feels about you, what He wants with you, not from you, but with you. See, this is a love relationship. I believe that's what Paul is saying. Part of it. In verse 18, with unveiled face, that means anacalypto means having, it's a perfect passive participle. The veil has been lifted and permanently removed. That's the ministry of the Spirit. <clears throat> then he says, beholding in a mirror, Katapatridzomai, it's a presence middle participle, while observing, and then he says, metamorpho, present passive indicative. We are being transferred. So the veil's been removed, and while you're looking at the Lord in the mirror, you're being transformed. While you're looking at the Lord in the mirror, where's the mirror? What is the mirror? Anybody? It's the Word of God. The mirror is the word of God. It's what James tells us. You look in the mirror and you see the perfect law of liberty. The mirror is the word of God. So you look into the word of God and you look at Jesus and then you look at me and you go, whoa, whoa, I don't look anything like him. I'm in, I'm in a very distorted, ugly looking picture of him. So I want to become more like him. So I keep watching him and I keep comparing myself to him. How do I treat my wife? I compare myself to Christ. How do I treat my fellow believers? I compare myself to Christ. You know, what is my attitude toward uh, all the adversities that are coming? I compare myself to Christ. Not other people. Not other believers. Not even myself. I compare myself to the perfect standard of Christ, and in doing so, I move toward that. They teach race car drivers, I'm told this, that when they go into a spin or their car starts to get out of control, that wherever they look is where their hands will steer the car. So if you're starting to move this way and you need to be going back that way, you look where you're supposed to be going and you will automatically do what's needed to steer the car that way. Wherever you look is where you're going to go. If you're looking at the world, you know, you're looking at the politics, if you're looking at all the craziness, that's what you're going to focus on. But if you're looking at the Lord, that's where you're going to go. So, as we get to the end of this thing, I mean, I got all these points that you can read if you want to, uh, called looking at the Lord, whatever we look at with our eyes, with the eyes of our heart, uh, becomes our hope, our expectation for the future, our intended destination, and our object of imitation and worship. In Ephesians 1.18, Paul says to take the eyes of your heart and put them on the hope of your calling. That's what you expect because of who you are in Christ. The riches of his inheritance, which is your rewards, 
and the power that's already put in you. You're supposed to look at those things. Be focused on those things. To be intentional. Let me tell you another thing. That's really important. The Christian life is lived by being intentional. You don't accidentally walk in the Spirit. You have to intend to be in the Spirit. In fact, the moment you let go of intentionality, you go back, you go back to your subconscious programming. And you go to sleep. And you just go through the motions. So you wake up and go, whoa, I'm over here. I'm sinning. I'm caught up in my human agenda. I'm pursuing the things of the world again. Not the Lord. And you wake up and you go, whoa. Let me acknowledge that, Lord, because I want to be back over here in the Spirit. In order to stay in the Spirit, you have to purposely intend to stay in the Spirit. So when you just let go, you're going to go back to the flesh automatically. So to be intentional in charge of where your mind is looking, we must practice what I call awareness and alertness. First of all, our normal flesh way of thinking I call autopilot. It's literally your subconscious programming that just runs your life. You know, you get up and you're half asleep, and what do you do first? You do the same thing you always do. Every morning you do the same thing, similar. You just follow this little routine without even opening your eyes. That's your programming, see? Aware is awake. Wake up. The Bible says, awaken sleeper and Christ will shine on you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, become awake, become aware. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, you should be aware of your sin. Examine yourself, become aware of whether you're sinning or not. And alert, aware, listen, aware is intentionally paying attention to what you're thinking. What's going on inside of you? Alert is looking for specific areas and issues that you're struggling with. You know, if you're struggling with an area of sin, I can't tell you how many of these young guys, Willie, you just don't know. I don't tell you. But there's a bunch of them that call me and say, I'm really struggling with this. And, and it's just lascivious sin issues that they're, how do I get over this? Like, well, you got to walk in the spirit. You got to trust the Lord and do the right thing and tell yourself the truth about it. You got to, you got to walk in the spirit, man. You got to choose to walk in the spirit. Then when temptation comes, you got to tell it, no, no, no. And the belief behind that temptation that says, oh, if you would just do what I'm saying, let me show you this image. Man, you'd feel so good. Yeah, but I'd lose, I'd lose my time with the Lord. Forever and ever, I'm going to lose that. I'm going to throw it away just for a moment of pleasure. And I'm going to feel so bad. So... A lot of that going on. You have to be intentional. You have to wake up, pay attention, and focus on specific areas. I mean, where, where do you fail mostly? Are you, do you judge? Are you critical? Are you oblivious? Are you into yourself? Oh, you know, are you ascetic and you're comparing yourself with everybody? Be alert to those areas. And when you find yourself wanting to go there, just go, whoa, stop, no. I'm not going to believe that lie says I'm better than they are. So one of, one of the believer's most important intentional goals is to compare yourself with Christ, not other sinners. That old thing, what would Jesus do? I can't find anything better. In marriage counseling, this is what you get. Two people come in and they're comparing themselves. They're comparing their partner with their father or their mother, whichever one. Or someone else's marriage that they think is, looks great from the outside, but they think is going so well, have no idea what's going on on the inside. 
They want to compare with other people. Or listen, the favorite comparison is with a Hollywood movie. When is he going to come in and sweep me off my feet and carry me to into the castle? And when, it's, when he rides up on his horse, the horse is not going to leave anything behind. Anyway, it's just, a, it's just we imagine life better than we have it. And we compare what we have and the way the others are acting and treating us, thinking about us. We compare that with some standard. If you're comparing it with Christ, if you're comparing yourself with Christ, and listen, not comparing your mate, I'll say this and I got to quit, but young couples come in and they're Christian and they say, what does the Bible say about what you're supposed to be doing? Talking to their mate. What does the Bible say? You're not doing that. You're not living up to that at all. You're not even trying to do that. I just have to laugh because I try to explain. See those standards you see there? Husband, love your wife like Christ loves the church. You're not doing that. You fail at that all the time. You're always upset with me. You're always... He's like, well, what about this submission thing? How about you? How you doing with that, hon? These are perfect, perfect standards to grow into, to shoot at, to shoot for, to become like. That's what it means to look at Christ and compare yourself to him. Father, I thank you. I pray that this lesson is helpful. It is to me. I, I pray that you... Father, help me not to judge. Help me not to compare others in my life to what I think they ought to be. To accept them as they are. Pray for them to grow. Pray for their, their heart to be increased and their happiness to grow. And, and I just, help me to be for them, Father, not wanting something from them. Again, I thank you for our church. I pray for Zoe, Father, that you'll heal her body. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.